Okay, so Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You eat, but are not, sorry, you drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, and on that grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. So reads God's word. Well, those of you who were here last time we had a look at Haggai, um, we looked, if you remember, at the introduction uh, to this book, uh, re reminding ourselves that it's what we call a post exilic book a book written after uh, the exile to Babylon had finished and some of the people had returned uh, to Jerusalem uh, we noted that the book has uh, unusually uh, a very precise dates uh, on when it was written uh, and although it's a very short uh, ministry uh, it's uh, it is Haggai who was sent to exhort the people to get up uh, and build so We've looked at the first of his four oracles, this uh, special um, word which denotes that God is speaking directly to his people. And uh, we looked at the little phrase in particular, this people, uh, this people were rebuked, they were commanded, they were promised, um, because this people were acting as if they'd forgotten they were God's people. They'd forgotten who they were, they'd forgotten their responsibility, uh, and we looked at the fact that we are the people of God and we have responsibilities to him. So tonight we're going to concentrate on the rest of the chapter, verses 12 uh, to the end. Uh, and uh, we're going to see what happened. Uh, my first heading uh, is uh, the remnant, uh, because uh, this word is uh, used here a couple of times. Uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. And uh, this word, uh, remnant, uh, is, is quite a loaded word. But before we get to that, uh, we need to just remind ourselves that they understood, the people understood this was a word to them uh, personally. And as they received this word, they are reminded that they stand in a long line of people who receive God's word. Clearly there had been no word from God for a number of years now. Um, there'd been uh, 80 years in captivity, 70 years in captivity. There'd been some years that had passed uh, for where they are now. And, um, and so the world is very different. And, and so the fact that you know, Haggai the prophet is coming to them at all 
uh, is a reminder that they are still this very special people, as we said, standing in a long line of people who have been sent a prophet by God uh, too. Uh, but of course, it's a very different situation now. For a start, Israel, as it used to be, is now no longer, um, and they haven't returned. Uh, the northern tribes were taken away, uh, and they are now virtually untraceable. There are mentions of them, and clearly there were some who kept their lineage and preserved it. We know that from the New Testament. Paul said that he was of the tribe uh, of Benjamin. We know that uh, Anna was of the tribe of Asher. So, you know, Asher was one of these northern tribes. Uh, and so there were those who kept their, uh, uh, their, their heritage, if you like. Uh, and if we just have a look in uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 17, verse 41, I'll, I'll just read it to you. We'll see um, how this, these kind of people um, behaved or how they, they kind of changed really after uh, all that happened. Uh, we read that uh, the king of Assyria uh, settles them or resettles them, moves a lot of Israelite people out and moves other people in. And yet we read this uh, as a kind of almost damning statement really in verse 40 of 2 Kings 17 however they did not obey but they followed their former rituals so these nations feared the Lord yet served their carved images also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their fathers did even to this day and we're not sure who is the writer of the second book of the Kings but quite clearly it happened several you know or a number of years a lot of years after these events uh, are happening so the northern tribes, yes, there are some we know, but in the main, they've kind of abandoned God and they've mixed off uh, with the world. And so they are effectively uh, the lost tribes. They've mixed up with the work. They, what they've done is they've mixed the worship of God with the Baals, Asherahs, and all these other horrendous gods uh, and idolatries that were happening. So God gave them over to be physically mixed with those nations and they were therefore no longer the pure race of Israel. And in fact, we see in Nehemiah and Ezra that they had become the enemies of God's people. Um, and uh, we see there was a head knowledge of God, but no love for him. So these people that Haggai is speaking to are numerically very small. And this, of course, is part of the problem. They are about 50,000 people strong, less than half, you know, probably less than a quarter now of the population of Colchester. This is their entire nation. And they're asking themselves, how can we ever be great again? How can we ever be the people of God again? Will we ever have a king again? I mean, they have Zerubbabel, who's a descendant uh, of David through Jehoiakim, uh, uh, but he's not a king. Uh, and so how is that all going to work? Well, Haggai I will deal with that uh, later on. Uh, and so uh, when we get to verse 12 of Haggai chapter 1, uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of uh, son of Jehozadak the high priest uh, with all the remnant uh, of the people this this remnant they are very aware of what they are they are just a remnant they're not a people really they don't feel like a nation although they are still this people as we read in the first chapter they feel their smallness their insignificance they are just a remnant but it is to this remnant that the Lord speaks. I mean, you can just imagine it, can't you, that, you know, if, if you know, Haggai the prophet was sent by the Lord to us, you know, in Colchester, I mean, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, you know, because it would be that God is speaking to us. And so they are still um, incredibly uh, privileged. God effectively is saying to them, yes, last time I spoke to you as a nation, um, you know, through a prophet, it was probably to somewhere like Ezekiel or Jeremiah when there were so many more of you. There was a king, there was government, there was the city, there was everything. But now you're just a remnant. But I am still speaking to you. And this word remnant, in fact, is only ever used about the post-exilic people, um, even though it was before they were captured sometimes. And it literally means those who, those who escaped or the surviving portion. But God says... I haven't changed. Maybe the first time I've spoken since the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, but Haggai is now my messenger and his message is spoken to you, the remnant, to you small people, you are still my people. And then secondly, uh, in verse 12, uh, we have what we might call leaders first uh, and then the people. 
leaders first and then the people, you see, because verse 12 says, then Zerubbabel, who's the civic leader, Joshua, the kind of priestly leader, um, with all the remnant, obeyed the voice of the Lord. I wonder if that strikes you as noteworthy. Uh, why should that strike you as noteworthy? Because we know that all the other prophets God sent, they ignored, didn't they? You know, Isaiah's message was ignored. It's Jeremiah's was ignored. Ezekiel's, you know, yours are the words of a lovely song, but they're not going to take any notes of you. Okay, Daniel didn't really prophesy. He was much more of a writing prophet. Uh, and so uh, this is something noteworthy. This is perhaps the first prophet that they listen to and they obey and they respond to as God asks them to. And it is to their credit uh, that they do so. And you'll notice, secondly, in that verse, how it starts. It starts with the leadership. And, and that took a certain amount of, of, um, of humility, I suggest. You know, here is Zerubbabel, uh, who is, after all, a descendant of David and Solomon and all the other kings and so on. He may not be, lead, he may not be king, but he is the leader of the people. He has been appointed by King Darius. Uh, Joshua, we have to assume, was in the direct line of Aaron. Uh, and so he is a descendant of the high priest. And, and these officers... Uh, were kind of carved out and begun to uh, kind of be distinct officers now. And in fact, as an aside, uh, this pattern of government was to be the instrumental pattern of government over the rest of the years until the Lord Jesus comes. Uh, although the civic leaders kind of decreased a little bit and the high priests increased. And so by the time Jesus came, the high priests really were the leaders under Rome. The high priests in many ways ruled the people. But Back to the text and to this political situation. So to this governor, to this high priest, this unappointed man, or they might say self-appointed man, turns up and starts to tell them straight. They could have easily taken offence. They could have easily said, you know, do you think you are hop it? But they don't. They obey. Uh, this, literally, it means they hear with intelligence, says the Hebrew, and not with hard and foolish hearts. And so they're to be commended for their obedience. They obeyed the voice. The clarion call and they heeded Haggai's word uh, or the matter that he brought and they determined in their hearts to obey him. Uh, and then thirdly we read that they feared the Lord in verse 12. Uh, they, all of these people, Haggai, Joshua and so on, all the people uh, uh, and the word that they obeyed the voice, the words of the voice, ugh, give me words out, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God has sent him and the people feared the presence of the Lord and uh, it's very again very noteworthy that Haggai's words brought a reverence for God's work and honor that had been missing okay uh, these words literally mean this word feared literally means <coughs> a, a, a fearful or a proper reverence something befitting the Lord of glory beforehand before Haggai came they were discouraged they were fearful uh, they'd stop working, uh, they concentrate on getting on with the living, uh, and we can understand that to a point. <coughs> After all, they reason no one's going to help them but themselves, and there were houses to build and crops to grow and you know, animals to rear and so on. And, and as far as they're concerned, God had just kind of slipped, really, out of their minds. He? It, could, it was there, but it kind of just slipped down, as we say, the pecking order. <coughs> the Haggai's message comes, and wakes them up fear and reverence for god were channeled into action and then interestingly we read in verse uh, 14 uh, so the lord stirred up uh, the people so you see the pattern here they've set their hearts to obey that's their responsibility but then the lord stirs them up and it means to have your eyes opened uh, and it comes from a root word which means uh, to be naked or to be laid bare. And what the text is saying is that Haggai's words had stripped away all pretense that they were doing the right thing. You know what it's like, don't you? When you're not serving the Lord and you perhaps know in the back of your mind that you should, you start to justify it. Well, you know, I'm too busy or no one else is doing it or, you know, I don't agree with this church policy and I don't like that thing and I don't like this. So we find all the reasons why we can't. We can always find loads of reasons why we can't serve God. And they'd found loads of reasons. But now they've set their hearts to obey because their pretense, their reasons, weren't reasons at all, their excuses, and they've been laid bare. That's what the word means. In other words, what we're seeing here 
is a demonstration of what practical repentance looks like and, it, and what it looks like for God's people. Because there are times when God's people need to repent, uh, aren't there? And, and perhaps we are in that situation ourselves this evening. As someone has said that real repentance is not merely saying sorry, but it is resubmitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ. I think that's a very important statement, isn't it? Uh, repentance is not merely saying sorry, but resubmitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ. So when we realise that we have sinned, or when we realise it's time to say sorry to the Lord over a matter, then you know a quick sorry on the way out is not really enough, is it? It's about rather an insult to God's omniscience uh, and his love. When we're conscious of sin, when perhaps we've heard a sermon, or we've had a word with a Christian, or someone's had a word with us rather, and we are aware of it, we need to get right with God straight away. We need to resubmit ourselves again to the Lord's rule over our lives. These people had been doing what we do when we sin against the Lord. They pretended they could do their thing and ignored God and his work. But when they heard God's word, they realised they had been found out. They realised their sin had been discovered. They realised it had been laid bare and they were, uh, knew it was time to deal with it. They were convicted, really, if to use New Testament language. They were convicted by the Spirit, a bit like those people in Acts 2. Uh, they were pricked to the heart or cut to the heart, I think the, the old version says. And they were sorry. And now, these people in repentance are eager to put it right. They are, as we say, up for it. Uh, and they are ready to serve uh, the Lord. And so this attitude has changed in their hearts. Nothing's happened yet. Um, you know, there's nothing, you know, the temple's not built, no one's done anything. But inside, a work has happened. Inside, they've set their hearts to obey. And in return, God has stirred up their spirit he has laid their pretense bare and caused them to see where they've gone wrong and they are determined to put it right and thirdly before it happens we have a gracious encouragement uh, a gracious encouragement in verse uh, 13 that Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people saying I am with you says the Lord and there are those who argue, is this a second oracle or, you know, are there two or there three or there four, whatever. But this is just, I think, a word of encouragement. He sees what's happening and he says, God uh, is uh, with you. It's a word of gracious encouragement. So he's not, you know, giving them any rebuke this time. Uh, he is encouraging them, reminding them that it is the Lord who has loved them and has returned them from captivity. And now he says, you're ready to work before you start. Uh, something I need to let you know, and that is that I am with you. And it's a very interesting phrase in the Hebrew because what it means is, is that God is effectively saying, I'm going to partner you in the work. Okay? I'm going to partner you in the work. I'm going to uh, kind of come alongside you equally. We're going to be equal workers here. Uh, and that's quite amazing, isn't it? Uh, what condescension we might say from the Lord of glory. And it reminds us again that God chooses to work in the way he does because he's decided to do that. We often say, why doesn't God do this? Why does he do that? And so on. But God decides that he's going to work in this way. He, he could do anything he want. He could say uh, and make anything happen with a word, couldn't he? You know, he spoke the world into creation. This is the God we're dealing with. You know, he spoke the world. He spoke the sun into being. Incredible. So he can do anything. But he chooses to use us again he could use angels we know that in the bible he does use angels to do his bidding but you'll notice that the angels tend to say to the humans god's got a job for you to do and they're just the messengers the angels don't really do very much not normally but here we are uh, god is not going to use a kind of powerful word he's not going to use angels he's going to work with us he's going to work with haggai and the people and it really is quite a remarkable thing but of course it's not a new thing every time we say the so-called communion or fellowship uh, in uh, 2 corinthians 13 you know the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit that word also means partnership so this is not a new concept that we have in, in 2 corinthians this is something that god has done before god enters into partnership with his people and then, uh, fourthly, they got on with the work. They actually got on with the work. 
uh, and uh, we read in verse 14 so the Lord stirred up his people and so on and the spirit of all the remnant of the people and they came and worked on the house <laughs> of the Lord and that's also important isn't it it wasn't just a rubber ball and Jehoshaphat you wouldn't have got too much done would they two of them going to the forest cutting down trees and lugging them back everybody went out to work everybody was part of it um, uh, I think it is, it's Nehemiah, isn't it, where we read the phrase, for the people had a mind to work. Mm -hmm. And here we have the same thing here. And again, uh, it's important to look at the words. The Hebrew text emphasizes the status of this work. Um, it's literally a deputy ship. All right. So it's God, something that God is deputizing to us. And therefore, it is not serve our work. It's not servile work, really? What, what is the work? Well, we're cutting down trees. That's as servile as you can get, isn't it? Someone's got to cut them down. Someone's got to strip the bark off. Someone's got to kind of, you know, cut them into lengths and straighten them up and start building the house and hammers and nails and all of that. This is, this is fairly servile work on the surface of it. No, says God. This is deputizing. You are working with me. You're doing the delegated job I have asked you to do. And the lesson there is that whatever we do is never meaningless it's it's never trite or worthless everything we do is valuable it is recorded in God's plan it is part of God's universal jigsaw we might say that he wants you there doing that at that particular time and we emphasize I emphasize this because sometimes uh, I'm sure Elijah is the same we hear people say oh well you know what can I do you know I can't really do anything for God you know I, you know, maybe I clean the church or I, I give out tracts or I do this or I do that. It's all unimportant. But as I said, these people were doing a very unglamorous job here. You know, it wasn't like they were doing what Elijah did, you know, taking on the world on the top of Mount Carmel uh, and single handedly reviving the nation and ridding Israel of Baal. Yes, that must have been a wonderful moment. Although, of course, we know what happened to Eli uh, Elijah afterwards, don't we? But it was part of the work that needed to be done. And so everybody who got involved in building the temple, no matter how menial a job it seemed to be, someone had to sweep the floor in the end, didn't they? You know, no matter how menial it seemed to be, it was all part of the work that needed to be done. And if you're like somebody like me, um, who, you know, is, is uh, <laughs> my head teacher said, you're too target driven. In other words, you want to see results now and you can't always see results now. You've got to wait. Uh, and sometimes... That's what we've got to learn to do, isn't it? We have to wait. But nonetheless, we still have to understand that the work God asks us to do is valuable uh, to him. It's work that he deputizes us to do. So how can we apply these verses uh, for ourselves uh, this evening? Again, we're, we're very conscious that this is, you know, 530 BC or whatever it was. It's a long time ago in a faraway place in a far away land and a far away culture and so on but it occurred to me in a quite exciting way as I was looking at this uh, passage that there's there are great parallels with us particularly us here in the chapel tonight aren't there because we are uh, working together with the Lord in this place okay we haven't got to physically go out and cut timber down and 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 put it up thank goodness so I don't quite know how many <laughs> how good that would be but we all have a job here to do don't we we're part of this work what is this work well isn't this work about reviving the kingdom isn't it about reviving a work that used to be here many years ago it is about enlarging the kingdom isn't it about working for the glory of God's name you say well that sounds a very big claim um, but but it is you know we're, we're all involved in the work and yes, you know, you rightly expect your leaders to inspire and lead in, in, as, as um, Zerubbabel and, and Joshua did. You know, they, they got up and they were the first to get up and say, OK, well, we'll do this. You know, we'll obey Haggai. I didn't know yet what the people were going to do. They were the leaders. They got up and led. But they couldn't have done much on their own, could they? As we said, you know, it's a slight, um, you know, I'm not trying to be humorous or anything, but the idea of two people trying to go and cut down trees and lug them all back and build a temple is quite preposterous, isn't it? But they led, and so the rest followed and worked with them. And so it follows, surely, that the kingdom will grow in this place in direct proportion to the effort that we collectively put into it, won't it? Just as it did then. You know, physically, 
they all had to go out. And the more that went out and cut down trees and brought them back and peeled the bark and shaped them and planed them and did whatever else they did to them, the better the work was, the quicker it was. And so there is a, a logical argument which says that the more we work together as God's people, the harder we work together as God's people together, is, you know, not, not one man doing what his own thing and all the rest of it, but together, then surely we can expect God to bless the work here. Surely we can expect the kingdom to grow here. There is a responsibility uh, on us as God's people to build the, build the church, to be partnerships, be in partnership with God in building the church. And you might say, well, how, how, are we, how are we all involved in that? Well, in general terms, uh, we look at uh, passages in 2 Corinthians and Romans, the end of the uh, book of Romans 12, and, and we see there that each of us, each Christian, has at least one gift from the Lord. There are those who have more than one, it seems. But each of us have something that we can do. I know this sounds really, really trite, but there used to be a CSSM chorus years ago uh, that some of us used to sing called There's a Work for Jesus, None But You Can Do. And, you know, it sounds a bit cheesy, but there is truth in that, isn't there? There is a work for Jesus that none but you can do because God has given you a gift and he's placed you here in this house to use it. So we need to say to ourselves, well, are we conscious of that? Have we identified what that might be? And if we haven't, then perhaps we need to, to spend some earnest time in, in prayer uh, or perhaps talking with Christians or, or even uh, talking with the leadership to talk to somebody to say, well, what, what can I do? What gift do I think that I have? And it will almost certainly take you out of your comfort zone, um, but that is kingdom life, isn't it? That is what it is. And just as to illustrate that and to encourage you in that thought, just think for a moment who Jesus chose to be the first disciples. We might say, well, a motley crew. But it's actually worse than a motley crew, isn't it? Just have a look at these guys. You know, a number of them are fishermen. Okay? So these guys are uneducated, uh, stinky guys. They're not guys that you kind of pop around for a cup of tea with. Let's face it. They haven't got a degree between them. They've barely got an O level between them, if we are to use modern parlance. They've, they've, they, what do they know? They know nothing. Why would you pick fishermen? All they know is about fishing. And, you know, sometimes when we kind of... Yeah, see them at work on the Lake of Galilee. They didn't see me that good fisherman either, did they? You know, twice they went out all night and caught nothing. So you've got fishermen. You've got an anti-government fanatic. You know, you've got somebody who's a troublemaker. Okay, Simon the Zealot. You've got someone who's a traitor to his own nation. We're not talking about Judas here. We're talking about Matthew the tax collector, who forsook his people and uh, forsook everything for money. This is what guy this is. He's a money man. He's a traitorous man. Perhaps there was one posh guy in the 12. I'll let you work out what that is. Adrian knows because we did this at the seminary. And David. So one, maybe one who had title, perhaps. But the rest? Phew. Yet these men turned the world upside down, didn't they? In the power of the Spirit. This is what happens when people give themselves to God and that God uses them for his glory. And so when we look at this passage tonight and when we see how God worked through Haggai, how he spoke to them and how the people responded, let's notice the order. They responded. They said, we will obey the Lord. And then God came to him, to them by his spirit. And so tonight I suggest that we come as we are and we come and we dedicate ourselves to you. We, we say, like, it, like Isaiah, here am I. You know, send me or use me. You know, if you're not going to send me somewhere else, well, use me here. But however you do it, Lord, here I am. Mm. And of course, the very first thing we do, and we're going to do it uh, shortly, is that we, we must pray. That we can all pray. And that's very, very important that we do pray. It's important because it reminds us that for a start, that we're a collective part of the work. You know, even when you're praying at home, praying for your brothers and sisters here, praying for the work here, praying for the needs here, you're involved in the work, aren't you? And let's face it, prayer is the most important thing. Why, why do we say that? You know, because I, know, I don't know about you, but sometimes when people say that, I feel irritated. Oh, you can pray. Very condescending, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I was reading a book this week and it said, if you think that you can do anything without God, then really, what is that? It's in practice. It's atheism, isn't it? It's saying to God, well, we don't need you. So if we don't pray, if we're not involved in praying, then we're really saying to God, we don't need you. 
or we don't think you're really interested in this work. And so, of course, those things are uh, terrible indictments if we go down that road. So we need to pray. We need to pray here. We need to pray at home for the work here, for uh, with the leadership. And we are very grateful for your prayers. Um, but, uh, you know, for the preaching, for you know, the, the serving that goes on, for the evangelism that goes on, for the tracks that go out, all the things that happen, let's be in prayer for that. Uh, and then let's see, well, what can we do? What difference can we make? Because Haggai uh, encourages me to think that you and I can make a difference in this city of Colchester, that he can make a difference through us. If we will give ourselves to him, no matter how frail or old or inept or whatever we think we may be, God can use us because he used them, this little remnant, uh, comparatively tiny, tiny number of people in the midst of all of these nations and hostile enemies. Who knows what he can do? Uh, but also, uh, and going along with this idea of, of us working together, let's also remind ourselves that we are all as valuable as each other in the kingdom. We must never look down on another person in the church. And we must never look at somebody and say, you're not worth anything. You, you are a nuisance here. You are somebody that we'd be better off without. God has brought us together. And so we must love each other. We must lift each other up. That's the way of life in the kingdom. And that's why I believe Haggai's message had such a great effect because the people together, and in that motley crew of 50,000, there would have been young ones, there'd have been old ones, there'd have been grumbling ones, there'd have been enthusiastic ones, there'd have been sharp-brained ones, there'd have been thick ones, there'd have been everything, wouldn't there? There'd have been everything. But together, they, we read, the people went and worked. Okay, there'd been plenty who would have got up and said, I'm not really cut for this, I'm not really a woodworker, but they went and worked. They got stuck in. So let's get stuck in. Let's say to God in our prayers tonight and in the coming days, Lord, we will serve you here. We will obey you here. We will pray and work here. We'll come and work on the house of the Lord. Let's be those people that work for God in this place. And may God do great things. Amen. Amen. Amen.